Can I pray for you? Father God, thank you for Emily. Thank you for bringing her here to Cogs. And Lord, I pray that you will speak through her today, Lord. Speak your words. Will you anoint her with what she has been given and uh, enable her to have boldness to speak it. In Jesus' name, amen. May I speak in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Many of you don't know me very well yet, and I look forward to changing that over the next weeks and months as I continue to work and live beside you as your curate. But today, I thought I would give you a few facts about myself. So, here's something that you would have undoubtedly learnt soon if you don't already know. I'm the daughter of a priest. In fact, some of you may already know my dad as he's the rector of one of our neighbouring parishes in Havant. My parents raised me as a Christian and I attended church every week. As a child, I loved church. My Sunday school, my youth group, I loved seeing my friends and being a small part of something much bigger. That was until I was 15 and my dad got ordained. We moved to a new church for my dad's curacy. Suddenly, I was no longer just another one of the teenagers in my church. I was now the vicar's daughter. The other people in my youth group looked to me as an example. I was expected to know all the answers to the youth's Bible quiz. My peers started treating me differently. I was now be expected to behave in a particular way, and I was ridiculed if I was caught swearing or listening to ACDC. <laughs> Suddenly, I found that I was centre of attention and was being asked questions I didn't know how to answer. Should I give the honest one or the one they actually want? I found that my house was no longer my own. Instead, I had people coming and going, and I wasn't allowed downstairs in my pyjamas past nine in the morning anymore. My life had become a sermon illustration, and I quickly had to gain the skill of small talk. But perhaps the worst thing for a 15-year-old girl was that I abruptly found that my social life had become the source of parish speculation and gossip. <laughs> Another fact that you might not know about me is that I am, to use the most recent phrase, a neurodiverse person. I am autistic. I also have ADHD, dyslexia, and dyspraxia. My dad, being ordained, coincided with me attempting to navigate a neurotypical world. I was wrestling with feeling like I didn't fit in, like I was an outcast, which led to a bad patch of mental health difficulties. I was resentful. I resented my dad for being ordained and for throwing me into the chaos of being a vicar's daughter whilst I was still trying to find where I fit in the world. I resented God. I didn't choose this life. My dad called me into it, not me. No, sorry, he called my dad into it, not me. I didn't want to be labelled as a Christian, and I didn't want to be picked on at school for having to be Miss Goody Two-Shoes. But in our reading this morning, Peter reminds us that if you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed, for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. As a church, We've been thinking about Christian persecution in recent weeks, and I can't begin to imagine what it must be like to live with that amount of fear, where you are judged and hated because of your faith. I can't pretend to understand or empathize with the intensity of suffering that our Christian brothers and sisters have to endure. I do, however, have some experience of suffering. Since being diagnosed with my various conditions, I've been on a journey with God to come to terms with the fact that I am fearfully and wonderfully made. There's a reason that I'm slightly quirky, and there's a reason that I don't feel like I belong. But when I felt God call me down the path of ordination, I laughed. 
after what I've been through as a vicar's daughter? No, thank you. I still hadn't worked out why I didn't fit in the world yet. But as I began journeying with God, I began to see that it wasn't only my neurodisabilities that made me different, but that I was being called down a different path to those around me. In recent weeks, I've been watching the TV series The Chosen, which I think our youth group has been watching as well. And I was watching an interview with the show's director, who was explaining the reasoning behind the show's logo. Dallas, the director, explained that the dark fish are to represent society, and the blue fish are to represent Jesus and his disciples. The show's opening credits starts with just one blue fish representing Jesus, swimming against all the others, swimming in a different direction. And as the credits roll on, more and more fish become blue and turn around to swim alongside Jesus and against the tide. In our passage this morning, Jesus tells us that when we suffer, we are participating in the sufferings of Christ. But I'm not sure that Peter was only talking about Christ's death. In his earthly ministry, Jesus was hated, ignored, spat upon and despised by the very people he was trying to save. And yet he continued to swim against the tide. In the Gospel of John, Jesus says, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. I believe that Jesus came to earth not just to sacrifice himself, but to show us how we should live by example. He demonstrated that it's possible to swim against the tide. It's possible to seek revenge. No, sorry, it's possible to forgive instead of seek revenge, to love instead of hate, to serve instead of dictate. Jesus came down from heaven to earth. The Lord of the universe gave up power and glory for the life of a poor man who only had the clothes on his back and even those were taken from him at the cross. The last point Peter makes in our passage today if this is going to work. Here we go. Those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. Peter encourages us to do good, to follow in Jesus' footsteps. Jesus points us to a life of self-sacrifice, not of power or greed or having to have the latest gadget or the latest fashion. Something I learned when I got used to being that vicar's daughter was that doing good didn't mean having to be a rule follower. It didn't mean that I couldn't swear or that I couldn't listen to ACDC. Being good meant saying to God, I trust you. This is what I have chosen to do with the life that you have given me. This is what you have called me to do, even though I'm suffering. When we're suffering, we can find ourselves on dark paths. And it's only natural to turn to the things that comfort us. For me, it's usually books. I'm a rather big bookworm, and I love escaping, into, escaping reality into the magical world that we can find between the pages of a book. Here's another fact that you might not know about me. I am not very fond of spiders. <laughs> In fact, I shamefully admit that I am somewhat terrified of them. It's an entirely irrational fear. I know they can't hurt me, particularly the ones in this country. I know that they're far more scared of me than I am of them. I know they're very useful at gobbling up pesky flies, and I know they're one of God's creatures. For all those reasons, I try to treat spiders with the love and the respect they deserve as a fellow creature of God's creation. So when a spider does find its way into our house, we will usually try and catch it and gently put it back outside. I'm also very grateful that my husband has gallantly taken on the role of resident spider catcher in our house, which means I don't generally have to do more than shriek when I find one. <laughs> However, 
a while ago, my trusty spider catcher had abandoned me for the evening. And I was sleepily staggering to my bed when I was confronted with a big black house spider on the floor by my side of the bed. So I tried to do good. I went and got a glass and a piece of paper, and with shaking hands, bent down to place the glass over the spider when it scuttled off under my bedside table. I was not going to be able to sleep with this great big spider in my room. So I moved my bedside table, found the spider, went to place the glass over it again, and it scuttled off once more onto my wardrobe door. By this time, it was past 11 o'clock. I was tired, and I just wanted to go to sleep. So I woefully admit that I grabbed the nearest book I could find, and I squashed it. I know, I'm not proud of it either. But it was only as I was scraping the now dead and squashed spider off the book and into the bin that I realized the book I had used was called Alive in God. <laughs> Incidentally, it's an excellent book. The author, begins, the author argues that we must show that everything we believe is an invitation to live fully. You would think that a book called Alive in God would be a lifeline to some Christians, particularly those who, for whatever reason, might be searching in the dark or feeling like their faith is dead. But sometimes it's just not that easy. I bought this particular book when I felt alone and God seemed to be very distant. I've been looking for some comfort and some spiritual direction, so I turned to a book, a strategy which had never failed me only to find, a bit like that poor spider, that the words on the page left me feeling empty and squished. In those dark times, God wasn't to be found in the words on a page, but in people. The people from my church, who surrounded me with love and compassion. However, it dawned on me as I was reading today's passage that for some Christians, those Christians who are persecuted for their faith, that reading or even owning a book called Alive in God could be the very thing that squishes them. In the first century, Peter wrote his letter to Christians facing horrendous persecution. They were exposed to torture, ridicule, and death. And sadly, there are still Christians today who are experiencing this same torment. However, participating in Christ's suffering doesn't mean that we have to be martyrs. We suffer with Christ every day. When we struggle to respond to all the challenges of our community and the starving world. When we're feeling ill or depressed. When we're struggling to understand or cope with our disabilities. When we're laughed at or smirked for being a Christian or following ancient traditions when we love our neighbor, but our neighbor doesn't love us back, when we're doubting the reality of God in our lives. My favorite scene from the TV series, The Chosen, that I've been watching is when a disabled disciple asks Jesus why he hasn't healed him, although he's healed others. Jesus responds by saying that hundreds of people can testify to being healed by the power of God, and so many more need to be healed in order to believe in him. But those who patiently continue to suffer, slog through day after day, and keep praising God, regardless of their internal or external torment, when they discover their strength because of their weakness, when they do things in his name despite their suffering, their impact will last generations. We can rely on God to be faithful, even though from time to time he can be difficult to find. Sometimes God's love won't be found in a book or some other likely place, but will shine through in unexpected places. We can rely on God to be faithful and to walk with us or carry us through our suffering, which means despite our suffering, we can get on with the task 
of bringing his light and his love into the world. Amen.